Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for spending your valuable time with the Adapt 2030 channel. This is for the cattle and dairy folks out there. Thanks for letting me speak at the presentation. And this is going to be an update in terms of what's happening with Australian temperatures. So you can follow along in your forecast in terms of how much availability of grains are out there. Shout out to Matt and Maria. Thanks for everything. And if you could push the link out, this is an actual update for what I talked about at the event. And I'm going to continue to do that. We're going to do every single continent through the countries and try to get a better assessment through this month of the data we have until November. Speaking of that, remember the Tongi eruption? Not a lot of people did. Look how the vapor trail goes up above the satellite. Highest ever water vapor plume on record hitting the mainstream news now. What are they trying to tell us? Different parts of the Southern Hemisphere are going to continue to have cooling and crop losses. August through October 2022, Chile, the monthly reading, blue dots, that's lost crops. West Australia pre-eruption, West Australia post-eruption. How's Australian agriculture going to struggle through this? We'll compare it to the Pinatubo eruption 1991 in June. So I'll bring you two years after the eruption, the cooling still happening back then. Back to 2022, New South Wales, temperatures beginning to drop and we can compare it to August 1992. Melbourne Cup, coldest in 109 years. Weather forecast showing that dark blue, that's below freezing and lo and behold, snow. Anywhere you see in the white, heading into summer in Australia. And a quick refresher for those of you who didn't see or know about the Tonga eruption. Here it is, blasting straight out of the ocean. Center column is what we're going to be looking at. The evolution of the eruption turns into that sacred geometrical flower shape. And most interestingly, this eruption actually goes above the satellites with the water vapor fogging out the lenses. And finally, mainstream media picking it up, talking about the highest ever Plume. They're talking about water vapor here, not full ash ejecta, 187,000 feet for water, which is something to behold, never seen before. 35 mile high ejecta water column in steam vapor. But when we swing back to Go 17 and Hamwari 8, it's showing the ash column reached 87 kilometers, which is 52 miles. So we got the ash going up 52 miles, the water vapor going up 35 plus miles. This is going to be a game changer for agriculture in the Southern Hemisphere. And before we start, just a quick word from our sponsor. Wall Street's fear gauge is flashing a warning that stocks could fall off a cliff. The Fed's fight against inflation is crashing stocks and real estate. Billionaire economists agree on two things. We're heading towards a lost decade for the stock market and investors need to buy gold. Goldman Sachs sees a scenario where gold prices rally sharply to $2,250 an ounce. And after millions of Americans have lost trillions from their retirement accounts, most investors are more concerned with return of their money than return on their money. Call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. 888. 546-7020. Mention the ADAPT2030 channel. You're going to get some first class service. Your IRA can be in physical gold or silver. And you may qualify for the no fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. Keep in mind that Patriot Gold Group, Consumer Affairs top rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. It'd be good to talk with them. 888 Five four six seven zero two zero, and now on 
with the video. So we're going to compare what had happened with Pinatubo with what had happened with Tonga and hopefully we can find some overlap in history and then see where these places will be lost first with crop losses moving forward. We're going to stay with just anomalies. We're not talking about altitude at this time, just with temperatures on the averages. So we will compare Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines. That was in June of 1991. So keep that date in your head there and we're going to move forward. So the arrows demarcate where the eruption is. Southern hemisphere temperatures are in blue line. Northern hemisphere temperatures are the black line. You can see they march lockstep with how much volcanic aerosol, ash, sulfur dioxide, etc. is in the atmosphere and then how long it took to cool. So it took about a full year to go from eruption time to max cooling. After that there was a one year in play and then ash started to dissipate out of the atmosphere. So this video will be discussing 1992, 93 as well as the modern day. So remember we're looking at a full 12 months before the full effects are happening. So quick primer again, Tonga, the area on the map where it is, east of Australia and remember the wind patterns below to Australia and then around the southern hemisphere. Some really good data now coming out, especially about cloud top temperatures and full cloud heights that it reached. So we are looking at 52 miles on the ash, 35 to 37 miles for the water vapor and about 300 miles across on this if you're going to look at it in that way. I linked everything below so you can do more research. So to put it into context, we still have three months of the effects of the ash into maximum whatever it turns out to be cooling effect, total solar irradiance, watts per square meter declines. You're looking at around two watts per meter squared decline. Also, the temperatures will finally hit the bottom somewhere around mid-January of 2023. Now, remember, that's going to scrape along for a full one year at that low maximum on the bottom until, as you see the profiles, you could do the same thing with the Tambora eruption, which I also did in a presentation, but that was a private presentation on the crop pricing and the same thing. You had the one year dropout, a full one year plus of crop in, you know, increasing commodities prices. And then once the ash falls out of the air, everything starts to stabilize once again, crop prices decline. So during this time now going down, crops look to increase in price for the full next one year from January of 2023 to January of 2024, not financial advice, just saying ash is going to hinder the growth of plants. Two years, we're going to be going through this right now. It's going to get nasty with the food pricing all the way through 2023. Now, what type of distraction do you think you need to throw across the world so for the next one year when crops are not really being grown in the southern hemisphere i'm going to say boldly 50 percent loss of all agriculture across the southern hemisphere and you know the tumultuous time we're having up here in the northern hemisphere growing sea roots blocked off fertilizer shortages uh energy shortages knocking into the chemical facilities no you know inputs coming in for the farm uh, Mississippi's low on the can't really export not going to get any alleviating of the the water levels until I don't know sometime in April next year a lot of problems you know everybody in the northern hemisphere is looking going what's going to happen in the southern hemisphere well this is it we got two years to wander through this together so that's why I've done the adapt 2030 channel this was inbound for years so here we are how are we going to have a solution to fix this problem Working on the mean temperatures, again, this is not including anything altitude. This is strictly temperature, but I will be breaking it down by altitude in crop grow zones as we move forward. So November 2021, pre-eruption taking us up through October 2022. So we got two and a half, almost three months of no eruption effects, and then post-eruption all the way until October as we speak. So it's a mix between the two, post and pre and this is how much we're looking at for the temperatures on a 30 year average difference mean anomaly but when we start to get a little closer in this is where it gets interesting may to october you start to see things have changed now that it's post eruption data only 
And as we move forward, just August to October, we can come a little tighter in on that to measure just the three months, getting later and later after the eruption, and you see how it gets a little bit cooler. That's two to three degrees Celsius, that dark green, that's crops struggling at best to grow. And if we just look at the October temperature mean anomaly, that dark blue of three to four Celsius below normal, that's a zero yield right there. And you can see how this is beginning to expand in the ten different temperature deltas. So keep this in mind. And we're going to swing right over into West Australia. I want to get granular with you here. West Australia only on this one. Pre and post eruption. Again, this is the full one year, November 1st, 2021 to October 31st, 22. You get that three months of non-eruptive mixed in with the eruptive effects. Getting a little warm in Western Australia, but if we come back again, May to October, you start to see what is happening to that warmth. And if we come August to October, do you see the dot form in there that was wider? And eventually we coming into October temperatures, definitely creeping into the two Celsius below normal temperatures, which will affect crops. West Australia wheat, here we go. Now, again, I'm going to bring you back Pinatubo just to reference this again, June 1991. I'm going to put these two together. And as startling as it is, October 2022 and October 92, which would have been after the Pinatubo eruption that crossed the equator in both hemispheres as well. But look where the cooling is in the exact same spot. So I think there's a trend here. So if we do come out to maximum, three to four degrees Celsius drop on a northern hemisphere eruption. What is going to happen on a southern hemisphere eruption going directly west with the ash cloud? Now, if we look at December 1992, after the Pinatubo eruption, same areas, you can see how it's holding on, intensifying, and then we come a full one year after the Pinatubo eruption, and you can still see that a full one year at max cooling after. This is what Western Australia looked like. We still got three months to go. So it's April 92 to March 93, a full year after the eruption, and you can still see how much effect it's having. Once we reach that full one year of the drop in temperatures from the ash cover, and then the full one year of whatever max cooling there is, then it begins to drop out of the atmosphere. And you can see it starts to clear off a little bit. Temperatures begin their upward climb once more. This is two years after the Pinatubo eruption, and from that point forward, everything stabilizes, and we got two years to look at this event in and out. So you can see a little bit of method to the madness there, and it's discernible. It's very clean how the pre-eruptive phase of temperature rise in Australia, then suddenly the eruption, and now everything's all in combination dropping. So we'll head off to New South Wales next. Remember, the massive amounts of rainfall in New South Wales, their crops are gone. They're looking at almost a total loss right now in New South Wales for anything that was in the ground and predominantly wheat because they're coming into the harvest season. How much will this affect world pricing based on what's lost out of the Ukraine right now? To be seen, it's just how traders are gonna run with this and either push it, try to make a vast fortune, or how news media are gonna to try to run with it to cause fear or not. Not sure, it's a kind of unknown, but at least you have the information, you see what's going on in real time here. So bringing it back to November, 2021, October 22. Again, this is pre-eruption Tonga, plus the post-eruption and these last nine months that ash been circulating water vapor. We can see it get a little bit cooler. This is New South Wales. And the rain events are not helping at all in any way, shape, or form. And you can see the trajectory there is going to continue to move down into the aquas. And that's scary for anybody that knows about crops. Now compare that to August of 1992. We start to see max cooling somewhere between August and then coming into quarter one of 1993. So here's your wheat map of Australia. Now, keep in mind, Australia grows an enormous amount of crops. I'm just focused on the wheat and kind of the, the grains. I should find the corn map and throw it in here, but we'll have plenty of time for different videos on that. In this series, Western Australia, you can see where the cooling is. Volcanic ash is going to hit straight in the middle of the zones there. South Australia as well. Victoria and New South Wales also 
Have you noticed that the cooling is directly in the middle of the crop zones? They're going to be heavily affected. South Australia here, which I was just showing you. Luckily, the Cape area isn't really affected too much yet, but that is a major zone there. And as we move forward, May to October, and then August to October, and we come just the month of October, and you can see it's progressively getting deeper into the darker greens and then into the aquas, which will be cooler and cooler and cooler. All volcanic ash based. And don't worry, Victoria, I wouldn't leave you out of it. Coldest Melbourne Cup in over a century, actually 109 years. But the headline kind of sums it up. Second coldest on record. You got to go back more than a century. Thank you for actually putting that into real context. So we can see a 109 year cool pattern on that. And digging into the weather forecast as the Melbourne Cup was coming up, pretty interesting. Now, so for those of you in the States, zero is freezing in the Celsius temperatures. 15 degrees Celsius is all what you see, that light blue. And then when we get down to 10 degrees Celsius, we're looking around 50, 5 degrees Celsius is all that dark blue, which is getting around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when you see those really dark blues, you're getting into freezing temperatures. And what's so interesting is everywhere you see white on this map here is snow. And we're heading into summer in Australia. As we come into December, they're going to be in midsummer, which I find fascinating. Again, back to November 2021, October 2022, pre and post eruption data mix. Notice the one degree Celsius warming there. And as we move into post eruption, what do we see? Green, green, more green in October. Seems kind of neutral, but I'm wondering, you know, how this next storm front is going to roll in. There's another Antarctic front after this one as well. It's going to be sort of a bombogenesis. It's going to be bringing more snow down to Tassie. Look at the temperatures. Anywhere you see that dark blue, that's below freezing. And as we roll out through the rest of the Melbourne Cup and into this week, how is it almost summer with these below freezing temperatures? And just a glimpse of the cloud layering at the Melbourne Cup, everybody bundled up. So that's the rundown. You can see it clearly post-eruption, pre-eruption, how the temperatures are mixing now. Ash layering, water vapor, sulfur dioxide, all starting to have an effect. Now this is not exclusive to Australia. Every single continent in the Southern Hemisphere is being affected. South America, Africa, the southern part of Africa, New Zealand. I'll have to dive in there. NIWA is putting out some real good data. But the forecasts seem to be a little bit off compared to what's happening in the real world. So as we march through this series here, absolutely going to track down every single country that's 20 degrees south latitude down to the uh, Antarctic areas. So we're going to be covering about 50 different countries. Hope you can stay with me again. Matt, thanks for uh, getting me off to the conference here. I well, hope you can share the data with everybody as we just continue to add on to it continuous addendum, continuous update because this is in play real time. And then next month, I have somebody helping me out, search out the data. We can get some GIFs together, animated GIFs, and then we can really see how these temperatures are changing. Start to map it up, look in the different altitudes, different crop growing zones, which areas plant and harvest date on the effects. And then we can get a really good map, probably wire it down within you know, several million tons of, of a full forecast for the Southern Hemisphere and its cooling and the crop output for this year based on the plant harvest dates, crops in the ground. And please remember, 10 p.m. to midnight every Thursday night, Ransom Godwin and myself going censorship free, freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio. I'll post the links in the community tab in the Adapt 2030 channel on which eight platforms we will be streaming live. Hope you can join us there. I do thank you for watching. Hope you got something out of the video and I'll see you next time.